All right, uh, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is writing modular JavaScript uh, with Browserify. Um, there we go. Uh, so my name is John Ferris. I'm the director of front-end engineering at Atten Design Group. Um, you can also find me as Pixel Whip on Twitter or uh, Drupal.org. And I work for At Design Group. We're a strategy design and development agency based out of Denver, Colorado. We do a lot of um, a lot of work for organizations, cause-driven organizations around the world. Um, such as Human Rights Watch, uh, the Guttmacher Institute. We do a lot of work with uh, higher education, so Stanford, Berkeley. Um, so yeah, um, today we're going to be talking about JavaScript and basically how to use JavaScript um, as modules, so breaking, breaking your scripts up into smaller files. Um, one thing I want to note at the beginning is modern websites are increasingly using more and more JavaScript. So since 2010, um, according to the HTTP archive, uh, the average website is using twice as many requests for JavaScript, and the actual files that it's downloading is, are three times what they used to be. Um, so this is a graph from uh, the HTTP archive, and you can see uh, back in 2010, uh, the average request for JavaScript files were, was 11, so they'd load 11 scripts onto the page. Uh, now the average is 22, and used to be 113 kilobytes of JavaScript, and now the average is uh, over 300. Um, so the usage of JavaScript has grown quite a bit in the last six years. And um, there's, there's a few things we can take away from that. Um, back around 2010, there was a huge shift, I think, in the mindset of front-end development, um, <clears throat> specifically JavaScript. So in 2009, it's when Node.js was, was first released. Um, Shortly after, early 2010, NPM was released. And this is when we first started seeing like an interest in using JavaScript outside of the browser, using it on the server side and using it for other applications like your, your build systems and whatnot. Um, also in 2010, uh, Steve Jobs wrote his open letter on Adobe Flash basically saying, we're just not going to support it on the iPhone. So this is three years after the initial iPhone came out. He said, we're not going to do it. So up until then, a lot of websites, in terms of like their interactivity, were focusing on Flash. So that was kind of the main technology used. So once that was gone, um, the shift of interactivity uh, moved kind of from ActionScript and more into JavaScript. Um, that same year is when Ethan Marcotte uh, published Responsive Web Design on a list of part. And I realized that that wasn't, like in his article, he doesn't actually specifically talk about JavaScript. It's mostly uh, CSS and images. But the consequences of that article when developers started looking at and designers, like how are we going to make this one site work across different devices different sizes, different capabilities. Like in reality, to make that work and make that work well, you do need to rely on some JavaScript. Um, you can't get it all done in CSS. Um, and towards the end of that year, um, so in October, Backbone.js was first released. Exactly one week later, AngularJS was released. And this is when we start seeing you know, the architecture pattern of uh, SPAs or single page apps. So at this point, we're moving a lot of some of that default 
native browser behavior that we rely on into JavaScript. So stuff, simple things like um, routing, moving from one page to another, that you know, as in a single page app, that's all handled in JavaScript, not by the browser. So all these things are requiring more and more scripts. Um, you know, we could have that conversation on that, the effect on performance, you know, obviously more page weight, uh, more calculations on the device. It's not necessarily a great thing, but I think you have to weigh like the growth in JavaScript with the actual capabilities and the things that we're relying on. Um, you know, scripts are meant to be more, or sites are expected to be more app-like now that we have you know, touch devices and phones and whatnot. Um, so another way to kind of demonstrate the growth of JavaScript in the last six years is uh, the growth of NPM. So if you're not familiar with NPM, it's a JavaScript package manager. Um, it actually can do more than JavaScript. You can keep your, your CSS or publish your CSS to that. Um, so this chart just shows, um, this is from modulecounts.com. They keep a running uh, total um, in statistics on various package managers out there and um, how many package packages are published. So you can see RubyGems is kind of, it's just been in a straight growth path. Um, once they started collecting data on NPM, you can see that line, it just accelerates. Um, and then there's also Bauer on there. Um, does anyone use Bauer? You know, a few people. Um, I, think, I think the trend now is people moving more and more towards NPM, just as kind of a central uh, repository for these packages. Um, but Bauer is still used quite a bit. Uh, as you can see, not, not nearly as much. And I think one thing that could be said about this is um, NPM, it's super easy to publish a module. I mean, you basically type npm publish, your module goes up, and that line gets, gets bigger. In contrast, we actually didn't include it on this graph, but uh, module counts did actually just start using um, or counting Drupal modules on here. And it basically, it shows up here as like, you know, it's, it's just a little tick right here. But I think that goes to show like the difference. I don't know, has is, is anyone published a module um, to Drupal.org? Anyone here? A couple people. It's kind of a pain in the ass, right? At least for your first one, you have to like, Drupal.org has a serious uh, vetting program if you've never published a module before. You know, once you publish your, your first module, you're kind of green lighted and you can publish whatever you want. But um, NPM is just free for all. But with that said, there's a lot of good tools on NPM, uh, a lot of innovative tools that really, in the last few years, I think, uh, made some positive changes on, on how we code. Um, so what is an actual JavaScript module? Um, JavaScript modules are basically small chunks of reusable code. Uh, there's also, and I don't want to confuse the module design pattern here. Module design pattern is an actual pattern for how you um, write, um, sorry, a function or an object. Um, when I'm talking about modules today, I'm talking about like a single file um, that exports a value. Um, so I want to read this, this quote from uh, Eloquent JavaScript. Um, so there are a number of reasons why authors divide their books into chapters and sections. These divisions make it easier for a reader to see how the book is built, <coughs> sorry, built up, and to find specific parts that they are interested in. They also help the author provide a clear focus for every section. The benefits of organizing a program into several files or modules are similar. So breaking your, your scripts out into small files um, there's a lot of organization um, positives there, as well as um, like findability and just structure-wise and like reusability for those those modules. 
Um, so some other reasons why we would want to use um, a JavaScript module. Uh, one, we just talked about this, organizing code into smaller files, aka modules. Um, smaller files are just, they're easier to deal with. You're not dealing with like thousands of lines of code and having to search through and grep through a code base to find things um, as long as you're organizing your, your modules well. Um, actual module formats provide a way for exporting and importing uh, values. They respect the global namespace. So one issue with uh, loading a bunch of scripts on your page is that if you have dependencies between one external file and another, um, most likely the, the file that you're depending on is exposing a, vari a variable globally. For instance, uh, jQuery. If you load jQuery on the page, it adds a variable to the global scope, um, jQuery, and then you reference it with other scripts and whatnot. The problem with that is that you get into like namespace collisions. If you get a bunch of modules all um, kind of name the same thing, you could be overriding your modules. Uh, global variables don't get um, garbage collected uh, at least as easily as um, functionally scoped variables. Um, so that's another thing we want to look out for. We want to use modules so we don't pollute that global namespace. Um, with a bunch of variable names. And managing dependencies. Nice thing about modules, they, like I said, they provide a way to export a value. They also provide ways to import a value. So you have a dependency, you have one file depends on another, you can import that other file and use it. And we want to be able to utilize existing packages. So this goes back to NPM. We want to be able to say there's a library like a Lodash or even jQuery we want to be able to just install that quickly, be able to use it, and kind of move on with our lives. We're not worried about um, too much about downloading some file, unzipping it, putting it in the right folder, and then referencing that. Um, and one thing <clears throat> I just want to reiterate, sorry, um, JavaScript modules export a value. So this value can be anything. It could be a string, it could be a number, it could be a function, it could be an object. Um, there's no like set like distinction of what you have to export. So if you want to export just an object full of configuration, you can do that. You want to export a string that's like your template, you can do that. So when um, some of these goals were first kind of discussed and defined, uh, two module formats sort of emerged. There was AMD and CommonJS. So AMD was kind of created more with the browser in mind. It was um, AMD stands for Asynchronous Module Definition. It was a way to be able to import other scripts from within the browser. Um, at runtime. So basically the way it would work, it was asynchronous, so once a module loaded, you had a callback that would execute that function that required that module. CommonJS, on the other hand, is synchronous. This is what um, the node environment is, is based on, and this is what we're going to look at mostly today. Um, and then kind of taking the best of those two worlds, there's actually um, a standard in ECMAScript now, on ES6 or ES2015, uh, that actually defines how modules should be imported and exported. And it kind of took the best of both worlds of AMD and CommonJS um, and brought that into a standard. We'll talk a little bit about how we could uh, use that today. Um, but for the most part, we're going to focus on CommonJS. I would say if you're, if you're first getting started in like um, modular JavaScript, I would definitely look at ES6 and start working with that syntax. It's going to be the most future-proof going forward. Um, so let's look at the actual implementations here. So this is AMD. We have a module A and module B. 
Module A is our dependency where the syntax is basically you define some value. In this case, we're defining a function that's being exported. And so in module B, if we require module A, we basically get that, that function and then can use it. Once that function loads, the function within module B uh, will execute. And that's pretty much all I'm gonna say about AMD right now. Um, Common JS, if you've used Node for anything, this probably looks familiar. Uh, so you have module.exports equals some value. Put that in a file, and then when you require that file, in this case module B again, you just say uh, variable module A equals require this other file. So whatever module A is exporting, that's what module A will be set to in module B. And then we could do something pointless like alert whatever that, that function is. Um, yeah, that is actually super useless now that I look at it because it's actually not gonna do anything but uh, print out the actual function. Um, real talk, I wrote this example super late last night. Very little sleep and some Irish coffee. Um, so that's, that's common JS. Any questions so far? Nope. Cool. Um, taking these examples, what they look like in ES6. So again, we have a module A. Uh, one thing that ES6 allows you to do is export a number of different values. Um, so in this case, we're exporting this constant squirt, square root, um, a function called square, and a function called diag or diagonal. Um, and then in module B, we can actually import those individual modules out of that file. Um, so this is nice where you don't have to import an entire file. You can just grab the pieces that you want out of it. Um, so there's two, two different method, methods of doing that. Module B, we're actually calling or importing square and diagonal specifically. You can also, in module C, where we say import uh, wildcard asterisk as module A from module A. And what that'll do is that'll import all of these exported values out of module A and tack them on as basically properties or methods of this module A object. So you can kind of see the difference here, if I can highlight it. Um, in this case, we're importing these individual Sorry, this is an exercise in uh, motor skills right here. Um, so we're importing square and dialog, or diagonal, and we're calling those directly. In this case, we're importing all of them as module A. So we reference those by module A dot square, or module A dot diag. Does that all make sense? Um, so there's also an alternative that this is this is closer to something like uh, common JS or AMD where you're exporting a single value. Um, so here we're saying export default function square. So that default keyword is just saying this is the one thing in this file that I'm exporting. If you use this, you can only export one value. Um, so in module B you would say import square. Notice we don't have the curly braces around it. We're just importing that one value. Um, and then console log. So this is working just like common JS or require, or sorry, AMD. Um, so how do we actually use these? Right now, even though ES6 modules are standard, uh, no browsers actually support any method for like exporting or loading them. I believe the latest version of Chrome has support for, I think, importing, but not exporting. Um, so in order to utilize this stuff, we need some sort of build step. Um, either some sort of build step or some environment that natively supports them. Browsers don't support them right now. Uh, Node.js supports uh, common.js. Um, 
If you're using Require.js to actually import AMD modules, you can do it that way. But you need some sort of environment to actually use these modules. Um, so what a bundler does, essentially it concatenates files. Um, so taking a bunch of files and grouping them into one file. Uh, it manages dependencies. So if you have a file that depends on one file, depends on another file, it'll make sure that those are all loaded in the same order. Um, if you ever end up, you know, you're working on a site and you get the error like jQuery undefined, that's probably because you load something, loaded something out of order. Um, but in this case, a bundler will kind of, it'll um, look at that dependency tree, which we'll look at here in a second, and figure out the actual load order of things. Um, and then it runs at compile time, so this is back to, it needs a build step. Um, now this is opposed to like a module loader like require.js where a loader is loading your modules directly into the browser. So you don't necessarily need a compile step before you like deploy your code or use it. Um, so this is kind of what a, a typical um, bundling process might look like. Um, so you have an entry file and a bundle. So the entry file is the single file that's going to import a bunch of other dependencies. The bundle is the actual output of that. So you can have multiple entry files. Each entry file is going to produce its own bundle. Um, and then you have what's called uh, the dependency tree. So uh, all these dependencies underneath, those are all getting imported um, and bundled into bundle.js. So what kind of bundlers are out there? Uh, there's kind of three, I would say two main ones and uh, a third one kind of up and coming bundler, I guess. Uh, you have Webpack, uh, which Webpack does, it does the bundling. It does uh, like your development server, you can bundle and um, like your CSS. It kind of, it works, it, it does a lot more than just bundling JavaScript. Whereas these other two, Browserify and Rollup, they're kind of very specific modules that they do one thing, do it well. Uh, Browserify works uh, by default off CommonJS modules um, and We'll, we'll look at how you can use the ES6 modules in there as well. Uh, Rollup uh, JS, very similar to Browserify, except that it uses ES6 modules out of the box. Um, and one cool thing that it'll do is, uh, it's called tree shaking. Uh, the way ES6 modules are defined, you can actually do static analysis on the code, meaning that like when it's compiling, it can kind of look at all the code paths as it's building this thing and find like dead paths where there's code that's not being used and it'll eliminate that out of the bundle. Um, so they say you're guaranteed to actually get a smaller um, bundle size if you're using Rollup as opposed to Browserify. Uh, we're gonna look at Browserify. Browserify has been around since 2011, so since NPM was released, um, is originally built as a way to take uh, all this code that was being written for um, the Node.js, like the server environment, and be able to use that stuff in the browser. Um, so again, it runs at compile time, it uses CommonJS, it allows you to require skip scripts uh, from NPM and one thing that it does is actually replaces um, certain files or definitions, like some of no Node's core libraries that are meant to run in that server environment. Browserify replaces those with implementations that'll run within the browser. Um, so there's some super helpful stuff in Node, like um, let's see the URL module or the path module, um, Browserify kind of, I don't know if you'd call it monkey passion, but it replaces those in implementations with browser versions. Um, and it has a really nice plugin API. So you can do, not only can you bundle these files together, you can actually uh, transpile the files. 
um, and we'll we'll look at some examples of, of what that is. Um, so how to get started using it? There's kind of three three main ways to use it. Um, you can install it globally. So npm install browserify the dash g says globally. So install this on my whole system so that I can then in my command line type browserify and then uh, the syntax is whatever your entry file name is and you just uh, pipe that or send it to uh, the bundle.js file so you have your input and your output and that's it your your files your entry files and all its dependencies have been bundled um, Another alternative version of that is to install it locally. So whatever project you're on, wherever your package.json file is, um, you can in install a browser file locally and run it from there. That way um, you're not installing this, this package, whatever version of browser file you're using globally on your machine, you can have a specific version for your project. And the way you would run that is, so you install it, just the same way, minus the global flag. So that installs it locally. Then in package JSON, you have the scripts property, and you give that that's whatever script a name. Here we're just calling it build. You can call it whatever. Call it Bodie McBoatface. Um, and then this is the exact same command that we ran here. So instead of running it on the command line, we're putting it in this file. This is handy if you have, as you can, as you're, you're about to see, like these commands as you're adding more features, uh, more transforms can get like really long and pretty verbose. So you don't want to have to type that every time. This is a way just to kind of take whatever command that you would normally run and run it with npm run and then whatever we called it. So npm run build. And then the third way is using the actual API. So this is a lot more ver verbose than the other um, two. Um, but when you get a fairly complicated build and a lot of things going on, uh, managing a lot of different files for, say, a Drupal project, um, it's nice to be able to like have this all broken out and you can add some logic in um, to how your build will run. So this is essentially doing the exact same thing this is. You can see there's a lot more steps in it, uh, but we'll, we'll see in an example why that's beneficial. So here we're requiring um, FS, which is a file, short for file system. Uh, it's just a node core package. This is what allows us to write files to the disk. Uh, require browserify, create an instance of it. We call it B. And then we do things to that instance. So we add an entry file, and then we bundle it. And bundling it doesn't actually send it anywhere. So we actually have to then pipe that to our actual output, the bundle file. So fs create write stream, that saves a file to the disk. Um, if you wanted to not save it to the disk and run it to uh, standard out and just show it on your screen, you could do that if that's what's fun for you. Um, and here we're running very similar. We have a build script. And in this case, we're running this build file. So not a specific command, but that file. And the command for that is just node build. We could just type node build um, directly into our terminal and I would, that would run as well. Um, so let's look at some different use cases here. Um, so one thing Browserify allows you to do is create some custom builds of things. If you've ever used Modernizer, um, you know, if you, everyone know what Modernizer is? Does anybody not know what Modernizer is and want me to explain it? You. Uh, Modernizer allows you to do, um, browser detection. So say you have a, a feature that you want to use, uh, like CSS animations, and whatever design that you've created, being a designer, um, 
whatever you've created, um, say it, it relies on that animation, uh, but you're, you want to make sure that browsers that don't support animations can actually run it too, that you provide a fallback for that. Um, so Modernizer allows you to do those checks. Um, there's a port of Modernizer called Browserizer. Um, the names get more ridiculous than this. Um, and what's cool about this is rather than going to the Modernizer website, checking all the boxes of all the builds, like the different tests that you want to run, and every time you want to add a new test, you have to go back there and check more boxes. Um, this allows you uh, directly in your script just to require the actual test that you want. So we want to test for animations, we want to test for transforms and CSS columns. Um, once we require those and we require browserizer, that'll actually run the checks. Um, once the, the browser loads this script and it'll add those CSS classes uh, to the body tag um, in this case, the, the lower example where we actually set that require to modernizer variable, then we have access to that so we can do uh, some of the other, like utilize some of the other features of modernizer. Um, for instance, if, if there are CSS animations, load this other thing or do this, this thing. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, requiring submodules. So, if you're not familiar with uh, Lodash, um, Lodash is kind of, I call it like a utility belt um, for JavaScript. Um, it basically creates a very uniform way that works cross browser for doing simple things that a browser should be able to do anyway. like array maps, uh, filters, and reduce. Um, it'll, it'll do that in a consistent way. Um, so this is a tool used quite a bit. Um, in this example, we have transformers.js. It's exporting an array of transformer objects. And then in autobots.js, we are requiring lodash. So that underscore, just like the dollar sign, it's kind of the symbol for jQuery. Uh, that underscore is um, often used for Lodash or underscore. Um, then we're importing transformers from this other file. So we're just importing that array of transformer objects. Um, and then creating a new, a new um, array called Autobots, and we're filtering only the transformers that are Autobots. And what we get is that Autobots, that, that single um, array. Um, fairly straightforward stuff as far as filtering ar arrays goes. Um, but the important thing to note here is we are using this entire library. We're loading all of, all of Lodash just to do a simple filter, something that most browsers can do without any extra uh, library. Um, so that's not very efficient. An alternative to that is we can actually reach into that Lodash um, framework or library and require that specific function. And that's gonna only pull out like whatever, whatever filter depends on out of Lodash and just load that so we get a smaller build. Um, basically we're just, rather than requiring the whole library, we're setting that to a variable of underscore filter. Um, yeah, that, does that make sense to everybody? Cool. All right, dealing with global dependencies. I mentioned we don't want to, uh, or we want to respect the global namespace. Um, sometimes, you know, we, can, we just can't get around that. We need um, some library that's been loaded globally. Um, in the case we're working on Drupal site, and especially if it's Drupal 7, it's loading jQuery globally. Um, in this case, we want to require that just so we're, we're being consistent. But rather than, if we do this, it's going to also include jQuery in our bundle. 
but we don't need to do that. It's already loaded globally. We don't want to load all that code again. We already have it. Um, so what we can do is use Browserify Shim. Uh, Browserify Shim does a few things. Uh, one of those things is allows you to require things that have actually already been loaded. So uh, how we use that is in the package JSON. We tell Browserify we're using a transform. The transform is called Browserify Shim. And then that accesses its own variable within package JSON. This is Browserify Shim. Every time we require jQuery, don't actually load that up, just reference the global jQuery that's, that's already there. Uh, this all also works, um, you know, Drupal's gonna load like um, in Drupal 7, you have Drupal with capital D, that library. You can load it in this way so you can require it and access that. Uh, same, so that way you have access to Drupal.settings. Uh, Drupal 8, that's actually its own global variable called Drupal, Drupal settings. Um, so you can access it that way and not include it in your bundle. So looking at a couple more transforms. So our dependencies don't have to be JavaScript. Um, this is the same tree we were looking at. We have dependency A, B, C, and D. Um, those don't necessarily have to be JavaScript files. Um, in this case, we have some ESX files just using a different syntax. Um, we also have header.nunge. So if you're not familiar with nunge, it's, nungex is a, a templating language almost identical to Twig in terms of the syntax. A little bit different API, but um, for, for most people that are writing templates, it's gonna work just the same. Um, and it's, it's supported pretty well. It's a, it's a project from Mozilla. Um, and in this, this other case, we have a YAML file, so breakpoints.yaml. We have breakpoints that we want to write in a YAML file and maybe access that in our CSS and our JavaScript. Um, so these files, they don't have to be JavaScript files necessarily. And what browser file will do, along with some transforms, is actually take all that junk and convert it down into a JavaScript file. So this is probably my favorite of the Browserify terms is nunjuxify. Um, so in this example, we have robots.nunge, and you can see this looks just like twig. Um, so for robot and robots, we want to print out this markup and print out these variables. So robot.name.team.form. Um, so in robots.js, again, we're requiring that same transformers uh, file, an array of objects. Um, and here's what's, what's cool about Nunjuxify, it allows you to actually require a template file directly. So we have this, this template, we're requiring it, we've got all our markup kind of segregated into its own template file. Um, in the JavaScript, we just require that file and pass it. Really, the, the only important part here is the robots tpl.render. Um, you know, in this example, we're just throwing it on the body of the page. You'd probably never do that. Um, but we're loading that. We're telling it that robots equals transformers, that other file that we just required. And this is what we would end up with. So just taking those values uh, from those objects in the array and putting it in your template. Um, this is really nice if you're doing uh, maybe a complex navigation, like a mega drop down, something like that. Anything um, dynamically light or loading, maybe a JSON file, and you want to take all those values and actually input it or output it as markup on the page. Uh, you don't have to, you know, screw around with like uh, defining all these different jQuery. Uh, elements and appending and prepending and before and after and kind of jumbling together a menu or whatever that way it kind of it keeps it clean and it's super easy to use um, so real quick how you apply transforms uh, we looked at sorry I'm just checking to see how we're doing on time um, 
So we kind of looked at this already. You can apply transform through package JSON, super easy. Uh, you have the browserify property that has a transform property, which is just an array of all the different transforms that you want to add. Um, the browser variable, um, this, is, this is something that browserify will use anytime you require a, a specific file, it'll map that file to whatever you have here. So in this case, um, for Nunjux, we want to use the slim version of Nunjux when we're actually building our bundle that's going to get loaded into the browser, or the, our actual production code. Um, otherwise, if you just require the straight Nunjux, it's going to load all the compile code. What Nunjuxify does is pre-compiles all your templates into functions um, that are much more efficient than like having to actually, you know, your page loads up on the client, they're on their phone, and you're doing all this like regex stuff to figure out um, how to compile a template. So that's what the browser property is. Um, you can apply it through the CLI, so if this is the way you're going, um, just the, the T flag and whatever transform you're using. Um, and then actually applying it in the, in the API. So this is that same example that we uh, showed earlier. So after we add the, the entry file, um, we're adding the transform, in this case, Nunjuxify, and then we're bundling it and writing the file. Um, so doing transforms, pretty straightforward. Um, one really big transform is uh, Babelify. So if you're not familiar with Babel, it's a transpiler. So it takes the new ES6 syntax that not all browsers support um, and like transpiles that down to ES5 syntax that, you know, like IE10, 11, uh, I think you can even go back possibly to eight, I don't think so. You definitely go back to nine. Um, but it takes, it's kind of like a post-CSS processor. You know, you can write kind of the new syntax and this will process that file down to the old syntax. So using this, then we can actually Rather than require things using common JS, we can require um, using or import using the uh, ES6 syntax. Um, so Babelify is, is the name of the transform. And one thing you have to do with Babel is actually tell it the presets, like what are the things you're really concerned about transpiling. Um, so these are pretty common. We have Babel preset ES2015. That one's probably the most common. Um, and then we have Babel preset React, which does like, um, allows you to use JSX if you're creating any React applications. Um, so a couple more, more things and then I'll get into, uh, I think I'm running out of time, but I'll get into an example of actually implementing this in Drupal. So code splitting, in this case we have two two entry files, we have x.js and yjs. Those, so x requires z and w, y requires just z. Um, so in a normal case, if you create these, these two bundles, you take your two entry files, even if they, they require the same file, they're both gonna bundle them. So you have that same library in both files. Um, which isn't very efficient. Uh, Factor Bundle is a plugin that'll allow you to actually take out the common files and break them out into their own bundle. So uh, just to visualize this, we have X requires Z and W, Y just requires Z. When we bundle those, we end up with X that has X and W in it. We have Y that just includes Y and then Z, because both of those, um, both of those require Z, it just kind of sucks that out into its own kind of common library file that then you can load beforehand and both of those um, X and Y will have access to it. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, this is how it works. Uh, this is using the API. 
Um, so we have these source files, which is an array of our entry points. Um, we import those, and then we run it through the factor bundle plugin. So we tell it what are the outputs. So what are the bundles that our entry points need to end up in? After we do that, what's left over are our common files, and we write those to the disk. Um, so it's, it's a little bit weird to get set up, but once you have it running, it works super well. Um, and then the last thing uh, I want to talk about is Watchify. So Browserify has its own watcher. So if you're used to using um, Gulp or Grunt, they, they have their ways of watching files. So this file changes, run these commands. Uh, Watchify has its own. You don't actually have to specify which files to watch because it just knows the dependency tree um, based on your entry points. And what it does is the first time it compiles the whole thing, all your dependencies. And then it keeps kind of a cache of all your different modules that have been um, required in there, your whole module or dependency tree. And then it watches those individual files. So if those change, it only has to compile like that one file and the things that depend on it. Um, so it's, it's super fast. Like, um, and a larger code base go from maybe four seconds for like the initial compile down to like just changing a single dependency and it's more like 30 to 50 milliseconds. It's super fast. Um, so Watchify definitely, if you're, if you're using Grunt or Gulp, figure out how to get Watchify integrated into that rather than their standard uh, watchers. Um, and thank me later. Uh, so how do we actually use this with Drupal, putting it all together? So I've got, um, this is just laying out what we're trying to do. So we have our, our theme, we have our various modules. All of those probably have some JavaScript of their own. Um, so here we have, uh, we're just calling it, uh, my theme is the theme, and then my theme.js, because I'm super creative with the naming. Um, so we have our source files, those get built out into the build files, and then um, same with the module, it's got its source JS and its build JS. And using factor bundle, we want to any, anything, whether it's in the theme or one of our modules, for our project, we want to pull those out into a single common library um, that we can depend on using Drupal. Um, so that's what we're going for. Uh, this is how we're going to run it. So we have in our package JSON, we have uh, two scripts that we've defined. We have a bundle, and that's going to run this file in the resources scripts directory called bundle. And then we have bundle watch, which is going to do the exact same thing, but turn on Watchify. So that'll be like our development uh, task that'll keep running watching our files. How we use that, so npm run bundle or npm run bundle watch. Now this file, as I said earlier, this is why I like to use the API because these things can get pretty complicated. Uh, we're dealing with like files that can be in different directories uh, depending on how your Drupal site's set up. Um, so this file is a little bit long. I'm gonna actually walk through these different sections. We have our NPM modules and the different things that we're loading. Uh, argv is a thing that allows us to capture arguments in our node scripts. So this is how we're gonna flag it, a particular script to uh, uh, watch with Watchify rather than just compile once. Uh, we have the file system, we already talked about that. We have globbing, so this is what's gonna allow us to say, I want all the JavaScript files that are in these particular folders, make those our entry points. So you don't have to always say like, uh, I've added a new um, theme JavaScript file, it's just gonna look for any scripts within a certain directory and automatically compile those. Uh, path. It's just a node module for figuring out uh, relative and absolute paths of files. Uh, Mcderp, uh, which is um, 
make a, like a recursive directory, essentially, uh, browserify, factor bundle, and then watchify. Um, then we have like our settings. In a real world use case, I'd probably break these out into a separate file, like per project. Uh, so I'm not including these like specific project details uh, right in my build file. But for this case, here they are. Um, so we have our source files. So public HTML is our root Drupal directory. Uh, this is a Drupal 8 site. So this is just globbing for in either of these subfolders, so modules or themes. Inside those, we want to look at just custom things. So we're only dealing with our specific projects. We're not trying to compile like contrib stuff. Um, this is just saying whatever whatever custom module or theme, if there's a source JS file in there, that's what we want as our entry point. Then we have a common directory, so uh, public HTML, modules, custom, this is where we want to put our common file uh, that Factor Bundle is going to spit out. Uh, whoops. Sorry. Um, so common path, where the path is, or actually just joining the file name and the path. Um, and this, this is just a sort of a helper function to figure out. Um, so wherever we found an entry file, wherever that source JavaScript file is, we want to basically back up two directories and find a, a build directory and put our, our built file in there. Um, and this is actually like the callback that we run. So in this case, we have our browserify entrant, um, sorry, instance. That's taking um, entries files. These are the files that come from our glob. Uh, cache and package cache are something that we just have to turn on for Watchify to work. Uh, here's where we're checking if the dash W is set. If that's the case, then we're going to watch these on this task. And here we're turning on Babelify. In this particular project, we're using React for some applications um, or some screens on the project. So we're loading the React preset. Here's where we are um, actually taking the bundle files, saving them out. Uh, making sure the common directory exists and then running like the actual, um, these are event listeners for Watchify. So every time something updates, rebundle um, and log what updated. Um, every time something logs, actually print it out to the screen so we can see what's going on and then our initial bundle. And this is just writing those out. So I wanted to actually just walk through that. So I know I've had a lot of, I find files or like a gulp task or something and I just copy and paste it and I have no idea what's going on. Um, so I wanted to walk through and kind of explain like each of the individual steps that we're, we're taking here. Um, this file will be available. Um, this is something you can integrate. Like I said, if you're using Crunt or Gulp, you can absolutely integrate that into your process. Um, but other than that, that is pretty much, oh, sorry. Actually including these in Drupal. So this is Drupal 8. We have our module.libraries YAML file. Here, this is where we're putting the common file. Um, the actual my module um, specific JS file. You can see here, we've got a, a dependency on the common file. So Drupal will make sure that uh, anytime we're loading, like we want to load this module JavaScript, that it's going to load the common um, script first. And then same with our theme files, doing the exact same thing. Um, we're just loading it and making sure that the common file loads first. And that's pretty much it. Um, I guess one thing to note, that preprocess uh, false is something, um, I didn't include it in this example, but we run um, browser sync as we're developing. So every time uh, browserify will bundle files, 
it'll refresh any browsers that are attached to like the browser sync instance. So you can have your your phone out, your iPad out, you know, Chrome, Firefox, IE, all out on the same page, and then all those will refresh and sync together. Um, one thing I found out in doing that, sorry, this is a tangent, um, browser sync doesn't work with the way Drupal aggregates a ton of CSS files. Um, so I'll put that preprocess false on any file that I'm actually working on, and then I can turn on aggregation for CSS or JavaScript in Drupal. It'll aggregate everything else except for the files that I'm working on. And that really cut down the time between like making a file change, hitting save, and when Drupal actually refreshes a page. Um, so yeah, side note, there's a tip. Um, and that's it. Uh, I'd love to answer any questions if I can. Uh, if you don't mind, um, go into this URL. This is just the session link on the site. Um, fill out the survey. Let me know uh, if you like to talk, if you learned anything, if there's something I missed. But yeah, any any questions? No questions. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a particular uh, minification plugin that you use? Yes, sorry. Um, the question was are there any particular minification plugins? Um, I, this one's actually more ridiculous than Nunjuxify. It's Uglify. <laughs> so it's basically taking Uglify and wrapping it in as a, a transform. But yeah, that works really well. And I would add it kind of the same way we do uh, the WatchFi task, like check if this is a production bundle, um, add that. So. Cool. Thank you.